getting to the main event here. I'm super excited to have Marty here. I think um, a lot of you guys are too. You've all been inspired by Marty in your career looking for guidance. You probably read his book uh, and his articles on svpg.com. He's the founder of Silicon Valley Product Group. Before that, he led product and design at eBay. Before that, he was at Netscape. Before that, he was at HP. So a lot of awesome marquee names in the Valley. He wrote this awesome book, Inspired. I'm sure a lot of you have read. And he's going to talk to us today about Beyond Lean and Agile. So let's give Marty a warm welcome. Thanks a lot, Marty. All right. You guys hear me all right? Yeah. Uh, thanks, Dan. And um, yeah, let's just switch up. I appreciate everybody coming to this. And uh, just before, seeing a lot of people I haven't seen for quite a while, and that's fun. And um, and I, you know, when Dan and I were talking about this talk, he was kind of telling me about the kind of community he's trying to nurture here with you guys and um, the kind of things you're interested in. And so we kind of was think we're thinking a, uh, a bit more of an advanced talk. I mean, not not necessarily that it's all that complicated what we're talking about here, but it's um, rather than kind of the normal talks I often give about the nature of what makes a great product person or something like that, but to really kind of talk about where things are going. And so this is um, some thoughts I've been working on, actually with my partner, Chris, who's here. And uh, so they're early thoughts, and I've been playing with them for a while. One of the things that's been inspiring uh, these talks, I'll, you, you heard enough about me, I think, from, from Dan, so that's fine. But if you have been reading, there's just, it's that time right now. We are seeing the, uh, you've probably, I just ripped these headlines right off of my news feeds. They're just all over the place right now. It's in style, it's in fashion to beat up on Agile and beat up on Lean right now. That, and, um, for those of you that have been around there long enough, you know that was always coming. It's inevitable. This is sort of how our industry works. Um, I've been doing this a really long time, so I've seen many of these waves. In fact, um, we have, when we started SVPG, we created a manifesto. It's sort of what we believe. And uh, one of those was that you never, get, you never tie yourself too closely to any one technique or methodology because there is always something better that comes along. But, I mean, at this point, I don't, uh, I just expect it. Because when something new comes along, there's a whole industry that is waiting, just waiting. There's the books, the publishers know they can sell a ton of books. All they have to do is put the buzzword of the day on it. Then consultants and trainers, and you know, you've all seen it. Um, that happened with, remember with Six Sigma, that was a big one for a long time. And, uh, and it actually took a, something that is really solid in its place and just uh, destroyed companies with it because, you know, this is what happened. The, the industries get going and then everybody's vested. So do, do you expect the publishers or the authors or the, the uh, process specialists to actually be objective about those processes? They're, they're too religious at this point about it. So this is what happens. And so every process, every technique kind of, you know, it's not a silver bullet, even though that's often how the press will try to position it. And then people realize that, oh, no, it's not a silver bullet. And then the backlash starts. Now, I have my own opinions, just like I'm sure you do, that some of these things that come are really worthy and some of them aren't. Um, my belief is that the principles behind Agile and the principles behind Lean are not going away and shouldn't go away. Uh, when I look at these articles, and honestly, I'm not even reading them all anymore. I think a lot of it is just clickbait is what it is. But these, um, you know, inevitably, the team or the person uh, really had a fundamental misunderstanding of some concept. We have, there's probably a thousand articles out there that derive because the, uh, People trying to do what they think is lean, they have no clue what an MVP really is. And they're just shooting themselves in the foot. And then they write about how it went bad because, you know, it's a bad technique. So this is just normal. Um, I, I, though, don't ever want to go back to the times before Agile and before lean techniques. The, um, but I will say that the, what people get too wrapped up in, I think, is the manifestations of those methods or principles. So those change. There's a lot of different ways, as you know, to practice Agile, most of which are not very useful, honestly. But when done well, it's terrific. 
So this is where I wanted to kind of push on. So I'm going to argue that, uh, that there are some core principles behind Agile and behind Lean that are very powerful, but they don't go far enough either. And actually, I will also argue towards the end of this talk especially that a lot of the best teams out there have known this for a while, and they've already been pushing past this. I continue to be amazed at the difference, actually, between how the good teams work and how most teams work. It's just not fair. It's not equally distributed. It's just uh, amazing. And it's not geographical. It's, it's literally right here in the Valley or in San Francisco. You can be across the street from a company, two companies, two tech companies, and they're easily a decade apart in how they work. So I, what I wanted to call out were some themes. I'm actually going to pick three big themes. That is what I, that, this is what I'm, arguing the seeds are already planted so I can give you lots of examples of great teams that are working the way I'm going to describe but I would argue this is what's really next beyond lean and agile now uh, I also wanted to say this is um, not that very you know, it's, a, it's a good sized group but it's not that big a group we can interact uh, easily so feel free to throw out any questions if I think something is not quite on you know generally applicable I'll ask to talk to you afterwards but for the most part, just throw out the questions, it's fine, or interrupt. And I, I do think this kind of talk lends itself more to a discussion. So let's do that. So, I, and I don't want to, um, you know, I don't want to take the time to kind of go through Agile and go through uh, Lean. If you've seen any of my talks, I, I have done that, where I sort of spell out the good and the bad of Agile and how most teams practice Agile is really not Agile in any meaningful sense. It's very much waterfall. Um, so if you're not believe that yet, I encourage you to go maybe watch that and see if that doesn't convince you. Um, a lot of the teams, it's so funny because almost every startup I meet, they start by telling me how they're following lean startup techniques. And I ask them just on the whiteboard to show me how they work. And you know, I'm trying not to laugh as they do that because they're really describing anything but lean principles. And so a, a lot of people misunderstand the concepts. But uh, and again, I've written about that and I've given talks about that. I wanted to kind of talk here more about, okay, so what? What's next? And, and how do you get beyond that? And that's really where I wanted to focus on these three key themes. All right. And, and I want to say, I would argue that these are, uh, they might not be, they're not talked about in Agile or Lean, but they're not incompatible with Agile or Lean. I would think philosophically they're very much compatible. Okay, the first one uh, is this idea, which is really what Agile, oh, sorry, what Lean is trying to get people to do. Of course, Lean is all about, so let's stop wasting so much time and money. Let's stop building. This still drives me nuts how teams tell me they're building an MVP and, and they've been working on it for four months. And I'm like, four months? This is, it's more like four days we should be doing this. You just orders of magnitude off. So what, you know, what they're really doing is just kind of building a half-assed version of their product. And, you know, and different teams will take a different approach. Some of them will just build infrastructure. Some of them will just build user interface. But they're all missing the point. Because the real point is in product, what we're trying to do is tackle the risks. And some products we work on, I wish they were more common, don't have a lot of risks. They're pretty straightforward, you know, we know what to do. But most product stuff we do, um, there's risks. And I think of those risks in these four categories. It's not the only taxonomy for thinking about this, but I find this helpful. The first one, and uh, to be honest, is usually the hardest, is value risk. This is, does it, is anybody going to want to buy this product? Now that speaks to both demand, right? Because if there's no demand, it doesn't really matter how good you are as a team to solve it. But it also and especially speaks to, the truth is, most of the time the demand is not that hard to validate. The issue is that you don't, you, your team doesn't come up with a solution that's good enough that causes people to switch. That's what it boils down to for so many teams. 
That's value risk. That's primarily value risk. Is it good enough? Ben Horowitz, who if you're in this room, you probably know who he is. And by the way, if you haven't read his book, it's my single favorite book on tech stuff. The hard thing about hard things for product managers and CEOs or startup CEOs. So, um, but, uh, but Ben likes to argue, look, the problem is to get people to switch to your product, it's got to be on the order of 10 times better. What does 10 times better really mean? You know, if you're, if you're doing a CRM solution, is it 10 times better than they're using Salesforce right now or something? Well, it's hard to quantify that, but it's clear it's got to be way better. It's got to be demonstrably better. And most teams don't do that, so people don't choose. They don't switch. So that's value risk. You know, the real irony to me is that most teams don't even tackle value risk because they assume value. In fact, if you're handed a roadmap in your company, that's what's implied. Somebody in some smoke-filled room every quarter decided this is the things that are valuable, and then we're there to build it. Which, of course, so you miss, that's no, there's no accident that so much of what teams build don't actually get used or bought. But we'll come back to that point. I'm not done with roadmaps yet. But, the, um, but value risk is huge. And honestly, a lot of our techniques are really, <laughs> that's where our time needs to be spent on value. We need to make sure the things that we're going to build are actually going to be wanted and used, bought. Second risk is usability risk, like usertesting.com is designed for helping us with usability risk. There, you know, today, there's really no excuse not to tackle usability risk. I will say of the four, that's the easiest. So it's like, shame on you if you're not tackling usability risk. Especially if you're a consumer company and you don't deal with usability, you're dead, right? If you're a B2B company and you don't tackle usability, unfortunately, you're a typical. B2B company. But if you uh, want to be a good B2B company, you will tackle that. Yeah, it's an easy way to differentiate. Yeah. Um, the third risk is technical feasibility, which really is uh, kind of a, it catches several things. Um, one is, do we literally have the skill set on our team to build this? Another is, do we have the technology stack to build this. Mostly, though, it's referring to, um, do we actually know how to do this? Is There's an algorithm question there. Now, if you're building open table and you're trying to do table management, it's not very high risk to be able to do that. I'm not saying it's trivial, but it's like solvable. We've solved stuff like that a hundred times. If you're doing autonomous vehicles, it's a huge area. I had one of the most amazing uh, visits last year to um, a VC, well, Google Ventures and Olive VC in, in Tel Aviv brought me over to spend a week with uh, over 40 of their portfolio of startups. And I had never actually been to, to the Israeli startup community. I was blown away because in here in the Valley, um, most of the startups I meet are doing things that are not honestly that technically difficult. They're almost all of them were like rocket science. They were blowing me away with the things that they were trying to tackle. They have some of the best engineers in the world. It's a whole other talk. It was so amazing to learn how they develop that kind of engineering talent. But let me just say, there, we talked a lot about feasibility risk because if, you know, until they can figure out how to solve that problem, they don't have a product. Um, and so we have some products that that is huge area, but um, that is definitely not something you leave. And in fact, a lot of times we'll see a product where uh, in sprint planning, the product manager and the engineers say it's, uh, it doesn't look too bad. But then, of course, it goes from the estimated maybe a sprint or two. It's turned into 10 sprints and still going. So what's going on is they didn't really assess feasibility. And no, they hadn't done something like this before. So anyway, feasibility risk is a serious risk sometimes. Other times, it's, an, it's no problem. The engineers say, I've done this many times. We're good. The fourth risk is, is the one that actually... Um, surprises 
the most product people. A lot of product people think they don't even need to worry about this, but it is actually the difference between a, uh, a, a truly successful product person and most, which is biz I call business risk, but that's really referring to we have to come up with solutions in product that don't, you know, making it so your customers love it. That's the first two. They can, the, they can use it and they want to buy it. That's hard, but in many cases, think like Uber, think like Airbnb, um, or actually even think Teslas. The uh, business risk can be huge because what we're talking about here is, can we do it in a way that's legal? Can we do it in a way that um, is consistent with our business development contracts? Can we do it in ways that we can afford financially? Don't literally bankrupt us. Um, or uh, can we, uh, is it consistent with our brand? These are all, or how about this? Do our salespeople, do we have a channel to actually sell this product? Can that channel sell this product? Do they have the skill set? Are they a match? Do they have the right relationships? These are, um, these are business risks. This is a product, a product team has to tackle all four of these risks. Now, clearly, um, feasibility, you're leaning hard on your engineers. Usability, you're leaning hard on your UX designers, product designers. For value and for business risk, this is, falls on the shoulders, actually, of the product manager. This is also why um, a lot of CEOs complain to me that their product managers are largely useless. They, they basically like to equate them to a project manager because, frankly, because they don't tackle either the first or especially the fourth, the business risk. They don't, in fact, the, the complaint often from CEOs, they don't even understand the business. They don't know our customers. They don't know our salespeople. They don't know how we make money. They don't know how we go to market. They don't know anything about the product, really. They just think, you know, that they're supposed to write stories. You know, that's, and so that is not, um, this is, this is a huge part of the product job. This is why, and some people get bent out of shape when, when I say this, so I apologize if you're one of them, but um, this, this idea, uh, the product manager really is a CEO of the product. But not in the sense, of course, CEO is the boss of anybody. That's the big difference. So forget the whole boss of anybody. Product manager's not. But like a CEO, a startup CEO is typically the product person. And they, ha they have to be because they're the ones that do see all these elements of the business and the product. So every product manager, to be, to be useful, you have to embrace that. So it's a super hard job. And again, that was another talk. I gave a talk a few months ago. I, I saw Dan there in Mind the Product at London. It's, it's a, probably the, the main product conference in our industry. And I focused, because this was really driving me nuts, because so many people think the job of the product manager is what they learn in a certified Scrum product owner class, which is ludicrous. It's, it's like, oh, yeah, I took a class in how to use Google Analytics, so now I'm a product manager. It's not how it works. So um, I, w I wanted to make it very clear, look, a product manager's job is super hard and way more than the rituals of Scrum or Kanban. And, and so I gave six examples, tried to give in-depth of what the product manager had to work out, which really tackled all four of these risks. So... The big key here, and this is the theme, and I would argue all of these great teams, uh, I'll highlight several companies in a minute that I think are awesome at product, and they all have this focus on tackling these before they build anything. That's really the key. The purpose of an MVP is to tackle these things before you build anything. If you actually have to build a product, you screwed up. So... That's, that's where there's a lot of confusion, but this is key. One way or another, we need to tackle all four of these things. And so that's a theme I see uh, in great teams going forward. All right, second theme. If you know me, you know I feel very strongly about this one. And it's, it, oh, is there a question? Please. The previous slide.
Yes. Yeah, you're wondering how you do that. Well, I need two days to answer that question. Uh, because there are, there are a whole battery of techniques that we have that um, the techniques are structured around these risks, or at least the way I explain them, they're structured around these risks. If we look at the situation and say, wow, there's a big feasibility issue there, and then we know exactly the techniques we need to use. If, we're, uh, if the issue is value, which is like I said, it's usually value, then there's a, the biggest set of techniques are for that. Uh, and of course, there's consumer techniques and B2B techniques and some other considerations if you're doing a device like a smartwatch or a phone, but there are a lot of techniques. And that's what's good. And just to kind of level set you, and I realize it's, I'm just teasing you here because I can't explain to you in a few minutes how we do this, but you should be able to do a, on the order of 10 to 20 uh, MVPs per week, okay? where each one is able to try out at least one different idea and tackle one risk. And obviously you don't do that by having your developers <laughs> take a sprint. Yeah. I have a question in response to the last thing. So I've given the same pitch and what I've heard from some people is Dan or Marty, you're asking for your PM to be like Superman or Superwoman to do all that stuff. Have you ever heard that and how do you respond to that? Well, to do all that stuff, which we're, which we're referring to the well, just even, well. The CEO of the product? Yeah. Like yeah. Just saying, like, look, look, we have to, or the way it goes is this is why we divide PO and PM, because no one person could possibly oh, do yeah. all that, right, that whole thing. Oh, sure. So, uh, well, okay, this is a kind of a different question. There's sort of two in Dan's point, really, two big ones. One is, well, one way to solve this is let's separate product manager and product owner. And so many companies are tempted there, because they... Basically, they've, they've got somebody who they'll just put with the developers. You talk with the developers. You be the product owner. And then you go talk with marketing and sales and customers. You're the product manager. This is a, this, you know, this a, well, okay, yeah, it does split the work, but it ruins the product typically. Because this is, a, what really makes product happen is the combination of the two. What informs great solutions is the technology and what it drives the technology choices are the customer issues. So one of the worst things you can do is break that. However, it's still a fair question, like that's a ton of work. Um, and I, I don't wanna, because it could take me an hour here, we could really get into what goes wrong for product managers and their use of their time. But first off, they have to stop being project manager. That takes a ton of time, that's probably taking most of your time. Uh, Second, they have to stop pretending to be a designer and doing things like wireframes all day, <laughs> you know? So Now, I also know that some people do it because, oh man, that's like the only fun part of my job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, what's really going on is more dysfunction in the company, you know? They're like, uh, somebody's giving them a roadmap, so they're like, what am I supposed to do, you know? A user story takes me five minutes. I need something to do. So, um, yeah, this is lots of, we've got lots of pathology going on there. But, um, okay, those are the main ways, though, we get this uh, job manageable. Um, we take away design, we take away project management, and you focus on the product. The other one in some companies you have to take away is product marketing, which is another huge and critical role. And if all that's thrown on the same person, you know, it's no surprise. Uh, that said, I always try to be honest, with, especially with CEOs. This is not an easy job. The product manager is not an easy job. In fact, if it was up to me, no company would have the title associate product manager. That is a really bad idea. Um, it's not a junior job. I mean, if you're, on a, if you're a developer on a team, do you want the associate product manager? No, nobody wants that. <laughs> right? And, you know, in de developers, we can do that because you've got two, five, ten developers on the team, and so you can have a normal distribution. That's great. In fact, I think there's even good to that. But there's one product manager. It better be strong. That's a whole other talk. <laughs> the main tagline there is you're looking for smart, creative, and persistent. That's really the, the fundamental ingredients of a strong product person. Um, I have written and talked a lot about that, so if you're interested, I can point you to other resources. But okay, so let me keep going. I have one question. Yeah. So among these four categories of risk, uh, which one do you think is the most tough to manage? Because uh, I'm from the 
a business background and I think um, I can manage usability and business and feasibility risk because it's very much, I would have some frameworks and I can use that. But then the value risk is like, it's very much intangible. Like, okay, I can take some customer surveys and like, you know, feedback and then start building a product and still it might not work. Yeah. So how do we manage that? Sure. Well, let me just say for all of these, there are good techniques. And especially value, because that is the most important one. So you can manage all of these. Uh, I, I always am reluctant to say what is the most important, because the truth is, um, depends on the situation, right? If it's an existing product, then they probably bought it already, but now it's a question, the value, will they choose to use it? So the value is a little different question there. If it's a brand new purchase for them, then value is huge. If it's something where there's high switching costs, the value is really, I mean, so we have lots of uh, situations there. But there are great techniques for this, for all of these. Yeah, what I'm talking about, talking about is it's time to get to work and use them. And do your job, I'm speaking to product managers here, your job is to do this before you write a line of code. So I'm going to show you what I mean by that. Am I real quick, can I say, like, if you have a question, just raise your hand. It's important for us to use the mic so everyone else can hear you and so we can record. Okay, so if you have a question, it's totally cool. You know what, I'll just repeat the question. Okay, Because cool. that'll okay. go faster. Perfect. Yeah, cool. Thanks, Martin. Okay. Second one is collaboration. Now this, uh, I, I always, I don't want this to sound like I'm being politically correct here. I, mean, I could care less about that. I'm not trying to be politically correct. When I, here's the issue. The, the way most teams work, you've all seen it. Product manager does some kind of requirement. It's often cap captured as user stories and some use cases that go along with it, but some kind of requirements. They give it to a designer that tries to take those. They usually mutter about frustration with it, but they'll, they'll uh, design a solution that tries to deliver on those requirements. And then, of course, it goes through sprint planning, and we end up... Um, Co developers coding. Um, that is a crippling way to work. It's what's, what's happening there, first of all, you'll almost never get any innovation. But everybody is living with the, con with the decisions that were made previous to them. That is just, I can't help but observe that is not how good teams work. And none of the interesting innovations in our industry that I, can, that I am aware of emerge that way. Instead, what product really is today in the tech industry, that's all we're talking about here. So I realize it's different in non-tech, but in tech, technology, what the, ina what the technology enables, I mean, honestly, that probably drives more real innovation than anything else. Especially, just look at mobile, look at the device stuff going on, look at the machine learning technologies and what that's turning on right now. Uh, but even before the whole machine learning fr uh, you know, craze, this was true. It's been true. So the technology enables amazing solutions. The technology uh, enables different user experiences. It's not just the experience that drives the technology. It's the other way around at least as much. The design approach will, dr will drive different functionality, actually. So the point here is that the three are completely intertwined. And one of the hallmarks to me of good product teams, really solid, strong product teams, is the product manager, the designer, and the engineers, at least a tech lead, at least some senior engineer, the way they figure out what to build is a side-by-side -side collaboration. So I mean literally collaboration, where it's a give and take. And the truth is all three care about all three elements, the value, the usability, and the technology. They all care. But obviously, the designer knows a lot about the experience, and the engineers know a lot about the enabling technology. And the product manager, if you've done your job, hopefully knows a lot about all the business constraints. But when you put those three people together, especially like product design tech leads sitting next to each other, honestly, that's when the magic happens. This is also why... I, so many companies continue to ask me, can we make this work with distributed teams? Uh, or, or they'll tell us, we're stuck with distributed teams and we're really struggling. Uh, and, you know, there are tools and stuff and we'll try to make do, but 
This is the real price you pay right here. The lack of that magic that happens from the give and take when you sit right next to each other and you work it out. It's not a meeting. This is definitely not a stand-up. This is, this is basically how we work. This is what we call discovery. We're just trying to come up with a solution that works. And so it's a blend of those three. That's a fundamentally different way to work. Again, I, don't, I would argue that is not at all inconsistent with Agile or uh, Lean, but you can read the Agile and Lean books. They don't say anything about working that way. So they don't say you can't, and Agile does have the principle about, you know, teams should talk, people should talk to each other. Yeah, that's good. But that's, um, this is a fundamentally different way of working. I will also say if you've been lucky enough to work on a team that works like this, it's awesome. It is a completely different job for the product manager, but it's awesome. Okay, that's the second theme. Yes? I think I'm still unclear what that means. Like, can you describe a scenario? Like, people spend an entire day in the same, you know, room, in the same pod, and just brainstorm? Okay, so the question was, what does that really mean? Um, fair question. Um, so... Let's, let's sort of talk, I kind of merged two things in there too. I merged in co-location with collaboration. So the co-location point, you know, I, I, I don't, I mean, some teams can't do co-location, but we try hard. Co-location just means the product team squad, whatever you'd like to call this, is sitting in the same room next to each other, hopefully close enough to see each other's screens kind of thing. So um, not on the same floor, not on the same campus, but sitting together. That's what we mean by co-location. Why is that so nice? Because it makes collaboration so much easier. You don't have to schedule meetings. You don't have to. And so then to the second part of your question, so, so how do you figure out? Well, let's talk. We're trying to solve a problem. I was just talking to somebody because uh, last night, the Facebook fake news problem, super hard problem. You agree? Super important problem, at least. It's also a super hard problem. There's all kinds of legal considerations, I mean, free speech considerations. There's also tons of practical considerations, ethical considerations. Uh, and then there's uh, tons of technical considerations and constraints and partnerships. There's design implications for this. So how would you solve that? Well, it's only going to be solved in a good way if if those three kind of skill sets get together and work it out, work it out. So it's not a brainstorming session. Uh, that's, you know, one way of getting ideas. We have other, better ways, really, of getting ideas, but it's one way. Uh, but those, the point here I'm trying to say is it's not the product manager defining requirements. So try to purge that idea from your head. Yeah. Okay, so the question was, so clearly business knowledge is pretty important, yes. Uh, so how does that jive with taking developers and making them product managers? And full disclosure, that was me. I was a developer that went to be a product manager, and I had a lot of hard things to learn. And I remember that I had this great guy who mentored me, and first of all, he, he uh, introduced me to this person in our finance department because I knew nothing about the financial side. I mean, there was no classes that I took computer science classes, not finance classes. And he was like, you really don't understand what margin really means? And I was like, no, I didn't know any of that. So there is some education. Uh, and everybody's different. If you are interested in this, uh, Google the term developing strong product managers. It's a, there's a tool that I uh, created a while ago where, uh, to me, everybody's different. You assess where you are. You can do this with your manager. Uh, and I do this with brand new uh, product managers that come from engineering or a great product manager that might come from marketing or come from anywhere. They're going to have some strengths and some weaknesses. This is designed to very quickly help you realize your weaknesses and uh, fix them. And it, it usually takes about three months 
for a new product manager to get capable if they have a good manager and they've got a good head on their shoulders. Super hard job, still, super hard job. Smart, creative, persistent. Yeah. Okay, the question was, what if your developers are all on, uh, you know, Israel? <laughs> it's another issue there with the cultural differences. Some of you probably are aware. The, um, so, uh, okay, I don't want to spend too much time on the, uh, the co-location and topic because it is pretty complex, but let me just say, plan, your first preference is to have one of the engineers here. If you have one of the engineers located next to you, I assume you're a product manager. Do you have a designer here? So if the product manager and designer and one engineer can be co-located, your life is tremendously better uh, for two reasons. One is because that one engineer can contribute to that technology discussion here. And two, because they then can be a much more appropriate liaison with the engineers in Israel. And that's uh, there's a lot of, to that, but they'll do better than you will or I will. So um, that's plan A. If you can't do that, then you basically need to get on a plane and be out there a lot. Yeah. It's got to be significant, though. This isn't a flyby. Yeah, one more question. Yeah, good. So um, I think I actually, if I can hold that, I'm going to show that in a second. Yeah. Okay. So one other theme, and I said I wasn't done beating up on roadmaps yet. This, I mean, it is time for roadmaps to go. I've been hedging a little bit on that, but let me just get it. It's time. Now, why are roadmaps such a problem? Because roadmaps are output. I don't know how many of you might have seen, but Jared Spool, who's an incredible character. I'm sure most of you know who he is. So he, um, he put that on Twitter, and I just couldn't stop laughing when I saw it. And, um, and by the way, it's entirely correct. It's just harsh. But it's, that's the problem. When you get a roadmap, now, there are a few exceptions to this, but the vast majority of roadmaps are prioritized sets, uh, lists of features and projects of what your company wants you to do or somebody wants you to do. It might come from the management, it might come from you, but somebody is deciding. And of course, this is really, first of all, it's the antithesis of Agile, really, because how Agile is that? You've just sort of locked in what you're gonna work on for the next quarter. And then it's certainly the antithesis of Lean because these are your big assumptions that these are actually valuable things to do. But that's not what the team spend time doing. They spend time uh, validating things like usability. That's what they spend their time on, the easy stuff. So, no. The point here is good teams focus on results, outcomes. That, so good teams are given problems to solve. Many of you, I'm sure, have uh, at least heard of the OKR system. If not, your company is struggling through it. Objective and key results. If you haven't heard, search the term. Um, it's not the ultimate system for doing this, but it's the most popular system for doing this. I'm still kind of waiting for, uh, there's more to come there, but it is a reasonable system for this. That's what it's for. It's to stop giving teams features and projects and to start giving them problems to solve, business problems to solve. That's what product, that's what good product teams are for. This is what it really means to be an autonomous, empowered product team. You solve business problems. So uh, that's what we're trying to do. It's a lot harder than just building features, way harder. But also, that's where the value comes from. And this is one of those clear differences between great product companies and great product teams and most. Um, and just realize, roadmaps are lists of output. That's all they are. Uh, and it's, it's not that hard to deliver a roadmap. It's very hard to deliver business results. But that's actually what they're paying us for. So, now... Part of that is changing culture of company and stuff. And this is where I wanted to kind of talk about how this plays out in different companies. That's what I wanted to talk about in the 
remaining minutes here. So those are my three key themes, and let's talk about how this plays out. One of the things that uh, I notice is that different companies seem to phrase it different ways. You know, they have their own nomenclature, they have their own positioning, but essentially what they're doing is this. Um, and I, I use the term dual track, uh, which I got from a guy named Jeff Patton. Many of you probably know he's an agile, uh, a big guy in the agile community, a good guy, a big guy actually in the user experience design community too. He wrote the book Story Mapping. Um, but anyway, in that model, it looks like this. There's a set of objectives, a set of problems to solve. So objectives in the OKR set, sense. These are, we have to improve our onboarding process because it's maybe it takes 30 days and it should only take an hour, something like that. Several of you are laughing probably because you have an onboarding objective at your company. Well, so many companies do. Um, but anyway, that's an objective. And then basically there's two, this is, this has been around since the dawn of our industry. There's two fundamental problems in software engineering, right? You gotta figure out the right product and you gotta build the product right. That's really always been true. It's always been true. But uh, of course our techniques are dramatically better to do that. But if you think about that, then there's a lot of um, ways companies refer to this. This idea of dual track scrum dual track agile. Um, I actually can talk about a scrum and a Kanban, Kanban version of this later. Or, you know, somewhere between five and 10 years ago, most of the teams I worked with were doing scrum. Now most of them are, are, have moved on, but it's not a bad place to start and it's, it's fine. But the thing is, you know, scrum is all about delivery. It's a delivery technique. It is entirely a delivery technique. The point here is that in, we are in parallel doing discovery. Now, earlier there was the question about, you know, like what's going on? What are the developers doing when the designers design? And I didn't want to uh, leave the impression that it's, um, you know, they're just sort of all hanging out. Just to be very clear, this is a one product team. This is one product team. I'm just showing work streams here, you know, just like I could show developing, I could show front end development, back end development. I could show, test automation and software development, right? I could show lots of different work streams. I'm showing the discovery and the delivery work streams here, but it's one product team, product manager, designer, engineers. And product managers and designers, their job is discovery. That's what they do. So that is their day job. That's where they're spending almost all their time. They have a little bit of time they need to be available during, uh, because issues always pop up in delivery. As you know, you, you hear about them at your stand-up. So you need to be able, available to answer those questions. The engineers, on the other hand, their day job is to build production code, right? That's their highest order. Uh, and so they're focused on delivery, but we need the developers to spend a little time on delivery for two big reasons. One is because, like I said, we want to make sure that we're using their knowledge of the technology to come up with the best solutions. And uh, second, because they, we want their assessment of feasibility early. So if they say, you know, don't even go there, this would just mean you have to rewrite this whole monolith mess we have if we try to touch that. You want to know that in the first hours of the discussion, not at sprint planning. As we say, if, you, if you're waited to sprint planning before you show your stuff to developers, you've screwed up. Yeah. Okay, so um, this is sort of a scrum version of this way of working. Um, now, totally uh, compatible with that, most companies I know sort of overlay these two. If you apply the lean techniques, MVPs, and I, it's, it's such a misnomer, right? Because it's, MVPs are not minimum, not viable, not products right? But they are experiments. And that, and they are, they are one, I think they were one of the two most important concepts in software engineering is this idea of an MVP. When used properly, these are experiments. And that's what we do in discovery. It's a series of experiments designed to uh, figure out the answer to four questions. Would they buy it? Could they use it? Can we build it? And can the business support it? And so once we get good answers to that, then it goes on the backlog. Product market fit is a product. That's the other really critical concept. That's a product. 
meaning we can sell this thing and we can actually build a business. You can't do that with an experiment. You can sell a product. You test an experiment. Now, of course, there's lots of different techniques to do each of those. But just the point here is product market fit is a product that comes out of delivery. That's production, scalable, fault tolerant, high performant code. MVPs are experiments. Those are what we do in discovery to figure out the product we need to build. And just, I didn't say this explicitly, but many of you probably know this. We have, I mean, I don't even know what the count is. I personally teach on the order of 50 plus techniques to do discovery. Lots of different, uh, almost all of them, these, these prototypes, which is MVPs are usually prototypes, they're, um, they're created by designers, not by developers. There's a couple exceptions to that that you actually need the to borrow a developer to do, but the vast majority of them are created by designers. There's another reason designers are so critical, and that's why at least you gave me a good answer. Your designer was sitting next to you. If, they were, if you were going to tell me the designer was in New York and the engineer's in New York, in uh, Tel Aviv, bigger issue. Okay, so um, that's another way of, of framing this or thinking about this. You know, customer development, which a lot of people do lump in with uh, Lean Startup, but it actually predates it. Um, Steve Blank talks a lot about it, but it actually came from SyncDev, a, a process, and I don't even know where they got it from, but it's been around, but it's incredibly powerful. This is one, um, and I didn't really even have to show this, I've just been plugging this technique because it's so powerful. In fact, uh, when teams will ask me what's my single favorite technique to give you the best chance of future success, this is my favorite customer development program. It's uh, also probably the most work for you, but it is, if you do this, it is my favorite leading indicator of future success. And what it is about, for those that don't know, is the idea is we're going to develop a set, an initial set of reference customers in parallel with developing the first product. So there is nothing better, especially in a B2B product, nothing better than launching with a set of reference customers. That's sort of what we, that's best practice right there. So uh, that's what this is designed to help you do. It really puts a great focus on uh, product and it also um, makes this whole question about what needs to be in the first product or not. It takes it from a very theoretical question to very concrete. That's why I love it. So. Um, a lot of, I'm thrilled that people are getting excited about design thinking. Many of you have heard of that. Design thinking's also been around a while, but it's really kind of come into its own, I think, for a couple reasons. One is the, the dis we now have a lot more designers. We didn't have the designers we needed. I mean, they were mostly graphic designers back then, and now we have a lot more UX designers, product designers that can really work with us to do this. Also, um, the, the tools have just gotten fabulous for for designers to use in discovery. Yeah. That's kind of, so the observation is, oh, this kind of seems similar. That's sort of my point. They're all different ways of framing. That's my point of this is, you know, I, I'll talk to the design thinking people and I'm like, guys, this is what we do. Yes, this is good. Um, it's, they just frame it different. You know, everybody, because they all have their own books and everything, and they're all trying to sell them and stuff. <laughs> but they're, they're really going after some key principles. One of the things I love about design sprints or discovery sprints, there's another really good book that came out recently, the ones by the Google Ventures team called Sprint. talks about discovery sprints. Um, if you look, if you read that book, you'll see it really emphasizes heavily these three themes I'm trying to talk about. It's not an accident. We've really realized that it's, they'll literally get product design engineering together in a room for a week in the case of a discovery sprint. It's a, it's a special case, uh, intense, like an offsite. Um, and they will figure these things out um, very collaboratively. I mean, that's sort of the idea. And they'll also tackle these risks before they build any code. And they'll also verify with customers. They're just 
it's a terrific, uh, again, terrific technique. It's kind of a meta technique. It brings a lot of other techniques together. So yeah, your observation is what I wanted you to think. Um, I love the Y Combinator guys. I'm a total fanboy of them. And if you haven't read, Paul Graham wrote an amazing uh, piece on, um, on building things that don't scale. This is sort of just how they frame this problem is first build things that don't scale then build things at scale. Of course, most teams we know, what do they do? They, they want to jump right into building, you know, the ultimate implementation. And uh, they, of course, are all trusting that the product manager knows what they're doing and that it's going to be, people are going to beg to buy it. But of course, that's not what happens. So the, we don't want to build things to scale up front. We want to first figure them out. It's just their kind of provocative way of saying, just figure out the product first then we can worry about the production engineering. A couple other examples of that. I know I'm running late. <laughs> Why is that funny? I'm not sure. <laughs> but, um, well, they, Google has been saying this for years. I, uh, I first started talking to Google in 1999, and this has been part of their mantra. They understood this really early. But it's all fake it before you make it. And that's, well, that's the same thing, <laughs> really. It's the same thing. Because uh, this discovery, like I said, these are not products. These are experiments. And they're almost all prototypes. They're almost all smoke and mirror prototypes even. I mean, there's a lot of kinds of prototypes. And some of them do have code. But most of them are facades. So yeah, it's, this is a, a very powerful way of working. Uh, same idea. And then uh, Facebook, which kind of famously, you know, early on it was move fast and break things and then, you know, they get a f more than a few users and then they realize it might be good to figure out how to do this and not break things, but they still want to move fast. It's the same idea. They talk about common infrastructure too, which is their foundation, but that's, uh, yeah, they're, again, same concepts going on. You'll find those three big themes. In all of those companies I just mentioned, you'll find those three key themes. They're tackling their big risks up front. They're working collaboratively. And they're focused on solving problems, not building features. This is kind of how I prefer to think about this and in my, this is sort of in my own head, my own mental model is, um, and of course a lot of the teams I work with, they're doing continuous deployment, they're doing continuous discovery. So that fits well in this. Uh, they're usually using some Kanban derivative and, and but anyway, it just the point here, and the reason I kind of like this way to think about it is because I, I never want teams to think of discovery or delivery as a phase. It's not a phase. Uh, in tech, you know, we are constantly, um, you, you just, you work on things for years, years. Uh, I was, you saw it. Google AdWords has been going, how many years now? Something like 16, 17 years. Last year they did $50 billion in revenue. So, yeah, it's a good thing they didn't just think of it as a project for a year or something. And so, um, but, yeah, we are, we're constantly doing discovery and we're constantly generating product backlog items and we're constantly building and deploying those. That's a team. Just another way to think of this. Okay, so I'm, I don't know. You know, we'll have to see how it plays out. I'm sure there will be people that package up processes and frameworks for whatever reason a lot of people love to. They want to see the book and they want to, follow the map, you know, but it's, um, I think you're going to see these three themes, no matter what, because they are real. They're the next step, as far as I'm concerned, on top of the principles of Agile and the principles of Lean, which are solid principles. But beyond that, I think you're going to see these themes. I try to get the product teams to focus on these three big things. You know, they're all serious, you know, they're, they're non-trivial. But this is really what we need to do. You need to make sure you tackle those risks and don't ignore the value risks. That's going to be where most of your time should go. Um, and, uh, and make sure you've really got that collaboration going with the true collaboration with product design engineering. Um, you don't have to sit right next to each other. It's just a whole lot easier if you do. It kind of happens automatically if you sit next to each other. That's kind of what I like about it. 
But if you don't sit right next to each other, you know, well, this is, I'll, I'll drop one other little bomb on you too, which is if you're a product manager, um, because I've been talking about what really makes your product succeed and your team succeed, but if we want to talk personally, what's really making the difference for so many product managers is whether you know how to manage your time. And I don't want to turn into a you know, time management talk, but I will tell you that it takes about four hours a day of real, I mean, this is using your brain, with the, uh, this is in the, to do discovery. About four hours a day. And again, it doesn't have to be scheduled. It's not about that. But it's not like when we're doing our email. It's not when we're doing meetings. This is, this is when we're figuring out the product. You may be literally in those four hours. You might be including time with your designer and with your engineer. But, uh, or, or going and showing it to, say, the sales VP to make sure that you could sell this or something like that. But it, it, and that certainly includes the time with customers. But that is, it's about four hours a day. And really you've got, not to be too harsh on this, but you've got two choices. Uh, and I don't want to be hypocritical. I took the bad choice here too for many years. You, for a lot of people, the when they do that, four hours a day is from like six at night to 10 at night. So you can do that or you can get really disciplined about your time during the business day um, and stop going to all these meetings and start leaning on others and stuff. That's another discussion, but I just will, however you solve it, I don't know how to do this job successfully without four hours a day of quality time. So one way or another, you got to figure out how to do that. Okay, I threw a lot at you. Yeah. Let's do the mic question. Now, we have runners on the side here. Can you talk a little bit about the details of the handover between discovery and delivery? And, you know, because I heard companies saying, like, we have a tiger team that's doing discovery and then we, like, throw it over the wall okay. to delivery okay. versus the squad. Yeah. Doing it so, within. so first of all, you never want a handoff. There is no handoff. And you definitely don't want two t teams. That's really bad. I mean, that's a whole other discussion. You know, when companies have those innovation teams... That's a sign things are really bad. You want to start working on your resume because they're in trouble. But that is, um, that is the innovation lab thing. That, 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 the handoff rarely works. So the short answer to that is if you included your engineer in discovery, they know what they need to do and they will talk with uh, th their other engineers about that. Also, um, I'm a big fan of something in Lean UX we call prototype as spec. So the, we've got a lot of prototypes in how you do discovery, many prototypes, and those prototypes typically serve as the basis, which are much richer than the, uh, they're certainly much richer than PRDs were and much richer than stories are. Yeah. Yeah, um, so on the kind of time continuum here that you have where you have the dis, you know, continuous discovery and then continuous delivery, when does the, 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 the learning that comes out of the capital C and continuous map to the timeline here at the bottom of continuous delivery. So, you know, cause it's all about, to me, it's about what learning and discovery, how long does it take to get that to delivery? Okay, so I want to be clear here. Um, so, and you're probably thinking like the old lean uh, build, measure, learn. Um, maybe. Maybe. That's happening here and it's happening here. Just to be clear, we are learning every day in discovery. That's right. when I said between 10 and 20 MVP tests per week. That's the frequency of learning. Now, it's also true that eventually you're going to ship something live to the world, right? Maybe mm -hmm. it happens here. You're going to get another layer of learning that comes because now you don't just have little samples. You have big amount of data, and we can use that to feedback. So th if, you know... If I drew all the real connections here, it'd just be a big spaghetti mess. But that's, there is also this going on too. But the primary learning, that's what continuous discovery, discovery is, validated learning. That's what it is. Who, who has, who's, yep. yeah, so go for it. Getting back to the roadmaps, you, you advocate ditching the roadmaps. Um, so at my company, we use roadmaps uh, for two reasons. One is for stakeholders to know what's coming down the pike. Yes. So like product marketing manager yes. needs to tell customers what's coming down the pike, yes. for example. And then the second thing is that it helps me as a product manager um, predict what resources I need 
right, to sort of staff these. Yeah, these well, things. you. I got to tell you, you sound like a project manager there, <laughs> not like a product manager. That re, that's because that's not really what we're now. Those are two. The first one is a more legitimate need than the second one. Um, we have. It's not that hard for us to figure out. The resources is typically your team, right? You have a product team. So but we can hire more people too. We can augment the team. Right? Yeah, that doesn't usually happen too fast. And there's a limit. You've heard the old nine women don't make a baby in a month thing. It's really true. So, um, <laughs> yeah. So that's, uh, but anyway, the point is, there are legitimate reasons that companies want roadmaps. The most common one is they, they want to be able to predict. The other big one is they want to kind of know you're working on the most important things first. I think those are fair. Those roadmaps are one way of doing it. It's a pretty crummy way of doing it, I would argue. I would argue OKRs do those two things, but a lot more. So there is definitely an alternative to roadmaps that I would argue good teams use. In fact, if you Google that term, the alternative to roadmaps, I've written a couple articles on exactly that. Hi there. Uh, yeah. You mentioned in the back, several rows. Hi. Okay. <laughs> uh, you, when you mentioned about customer development um, and developing a set of uh, reference customers uh, and that that's a successful technique, do you mean actual people or do you mean like personas, like Oh yeah, these User are, segmentation. sorry, a, re a reference customer, it is worth highlighting. Reference customer is one of the most important concepts in the product world. They are real customers, <laughs> real customers, uh, that have bought the product, not just uh, given it to them like little, hey, give us a quote, we'll give you the product, that doesn't count. Uh, these are real customers that have bought the product and they're using it not as a test, but for production use. That, and oh, by the way, and they love it so much that they're willing to tell the world how much they love it. That's a reference customer. That's a big deal, and I will tell you it's a lot of work, but when you get a set of reference customers in a specific market, that's actually my favorite demonstration or proof point of product market fit. So for a specific target market to get a threshold number in the B2B world, I usually argue that's six customers, live and referenceable. That's a big, that's worth celebrating. Okay, so as a, as a follow-up, how does that work in like a pre-launch, like before you've actually had a chance to, is the technique not usable in that case, in a pre-release state? Um, normally, we so okay. This the whole idea of customer development. You don't do it for every little feature, but you do it for big things. And launching a new product is kind of the main. It's not the only one. If you do a redesign, it's good. If you bring it to another country, it's really good. There's a lot of other uses of it. The main one is what we're describing. And the way I would frame it is, you're not ready to launch until you have your six reference customers. So that's what you use this program for. I'm probably, I, I could spend an hour just on customer development and it's a really great talk. There, it's a great topic. There is a book called Lean Customer Development that I thought did a pretty good job describing it. Thanks. Sure. Who else had this Hi, microphone? Here. Yeah. Hi. So how should companies calculate the ROI of their product teams? How should companies calculate the ROI of the product teams? Or team? the teams themselves. So we, our company, um, last year it was really waterfall. Now we're stepping into agile, but we still have a roadmap which is sort of handed to us. And for us to get so you're ten percent agile. Five. <laughs> <laughs> for us to get a third product team or fourth, and talk to the finance department to get funding for it, how would we? Yeah. I know, and I've had this conversation with more than a few CFOs and CEOs. So this is a top, I assume this is an older company we're talking about. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, because the old companies, that's sort of how they worked. You would go for funding for, and of course they, they don't know what to do with this because I, instead of funding a project, we're talking about funding teams. So, and you know, they used to think they had ROIs for projects, which were Ridiculous, of course, because they had no clue what they'd actually do. But they still played the game of a business case. And you can still play the game of the business case. Um, but the short answer is what we typically do in that situation is convince them just to fund teams for quarters. 
And, and they will judge, of course, at the end of the quarter, at the end of the year. They might say, this team was doing great. We're going to keep going. This team's gone nowhere fast. We're going to stop that. That's, that's probably what you'll, that's probably the compromise you'll end up with. Okay, thank you. Sure. Who has the, uh, there you go. So you've done a really good job of laying out about uh, 10 different styles of, uh, of, of development and, and so on. Of, of but hopefully you saw they're all basically the same. Yeah, and some of them are actually kind of humorous, so that's <laughs> kind of fun. Um, but at the end of the day, who makes the decision on which to follow? I mean, you've also said that the, the golden triangle is the UX sort of product development uh, holy triangle. Uh, who makes the decision out of that which style to follow? On how you're going to work. Sure. Yeah. Um, Okay, that's a fair question. The, um, I will say when it comes to delivery in almost every company, it's the engineering organization that will decide that. That's kind of their world, and that's fine. So delivery is kind of up to them. Discovery is typically product and UX design. And it's usually the leader of product and UX, which is usually you know, the same person that they, uh, they usually come together. They will decide you know, kind of how they'll work. Um, and some companies like everybody to work the same way. Other ones are like, hey, teams do their thing. That's part of autonomy. If you want to work a little differently, that's fine. Um, yeah. And there's trade-offs, of course. This whole issue of team autonomy is a really complicated issue. There's a lot of dimensions to autonomy. And uh, it is all about product teams, squads, whatever you want to call them, dedicated product teams, durable product teams, and lead startup lingo. There, uh, it, everything boils down to do you have one of these really good teams or, or are you on one of these really good teams? And of course, for a lot of bigger companies, the challenge is to have many of these teams. And then scale brings its own challenges. How do you make sure these 25 autonomous teams aren't going in 25 directions? That's, and we could talk about that too. But that's what, um, you know, that's, that's the, the game. And it's normal. I think it's healthy even when they all kind of make little differences on how they work and try things out. Sure. There was, yeah. Uh, so although the title of the presentation is Beyond Lean and Agile, but is there a team today or a product today that follows all three in your opinion? And if so, could you explain all three? How, all three of the principles. That oh, no, I think those, yeah, I was trying to say, uh, of course, this is always tough because there's some of these bigger companies. The little companies, problem is people don't know, right? But in the big companies, uh, a lot of the teams at Google work uh, beautifully this way. Some of the best product people went and started Google Ventures. That's why I like that, uh, that book, Sprint. You can read that. And they also talk about, I don't know how many of you read the book, but there's about, what, 50 different examples in there, great examples from teams um, that, that largely that's what they are doing. They're trying, they wrote a whole book on a specific way to do discovery in a week. So yeah, you can see it's Slack and tons of examples you'll relate to. Uh, a lot of the teams at Facebook are awesome. A lot of the teams at Amazon are awesome. A lot of the ones at uh, Netflix are awesome. So yeah, to me, it's not usually an accident. When you've got a great result, there's usually some teams that figured out, figured these things out. Yeah. Going back to the associate product manager role, what if a PM's area of the product becomes so big and complex that it's unmanageable for a single person to do it? Is it better to split that up into two more seasoned product managers or have one more experienced senior PM with an associate or someone growing into that role, supporting them to give them some extra horsepower? Yeah, not so much. <laughs> well, you can hear my bias. Forget the associate thing. <laughs> the, ass the assistant thing just rarely works out the way we want. Uh, now, of course, just like if you get 15 developers on one product team, the engineers are start going to say, we got to split this into two teams. It's just unmanageable. The product manager is probably crying by then, too, that there's just so keeping 15 developers with good stuff to build, that's a ton of work. So they've probably been begging for some help, too. So the natural way this is handled is to split into multiple teams. And just to be very clear, and hopefully everybody's with me on this, one product manager, one product backlog, one product team. No, no silliness with like sharing backlogs or anything like that. One, 
Now that team can be anywhere from two developers to like 15 developers for a very big team. But that's, uh, most teams are more like three or four or five developers. Now there is another layer to this that gets interesting, uh, you know, if you are a little larger organization. There's an awesome role called the group product manager. It's not enough companies embrace this role. It's an awesome role. Yeah, the GPM is a player coach. So a GPM is a product manager of a team, but he or she has one, two, or maybe as many as three. That would be a lot. Other product managers that they are also coaching, mentoring, very hands-on. Uh, and we normally group those GPMs by area. I mean, I'll pick, a, let's say it's Uber. I, I'm, Uber is way bigger now, but early Uber, you could imagine a GPM for driver side, GPM for rider side, and having a few teams in each. So a GPM is a really nice sort of way to tackle some of this. And of course, as you scale, you get directors and the org grows. There is, yeah. Thank you for the talk. Um, I, I like, I mean, I think all the all the frameworks you laid out uh, really resonated when um, when you're developing a more, like you said, a more traditional um, product. Like, like I'm not saying that Open Table is a good example, but but I'm finding it harder to put the framework to work when you're working with um, more and more companies uh, employ AI technologies. You know, a lot of like, let's say, you know, an example would be like how. What is a product manager's role in the autonomous driving car? Oh, like yeah, no, that's like a that, great that question. Do you feel that the framework is different, or like in terms of you know accessing risks? Like the let's talk about it. I actually had that discussion at least with them. I would love to work with Tesla, but they've never once called me. <laughs> I wish they would. But uh, but with the Google autonomous, I talked to several product managers with the autonomous vehicle there. And that is a great example of really everything we're talking about. Just think about it. The, um, well, there's no question there's huge technical risks, right? So everybody, that's not easy, right? That, that it's actually happening way faster than I thought it would happen. But that's amazing. Uh, there's also very serious usability risks. If any of you aren't convinced of that, just try flipping on the autopilot on a Tesla and for the first time. Where you kind of have to take your hands off the wheel leap of faith. There's big uh, user experience challenges. Um, and as hard as uh, those are, um, the business risk, just, I mean, I mean, literally risk. You don't want to kill anybody in this stuff. You want to, this is, this is very difficult, you know, in the way they have to navigate these things. So, so there's legal, there's financial, there's, um, uh, governance risks, there's privacy issues. There's, so the product manager brings a huge amount to this discussion. Uh, and I would argue that autonomous vehicles would be a poster child for needing an awesome product manager that can cover the, the value is not really the question there, right? Because most of us would probably leap at the chance to buy a truly autonomous vehicle today if we could. Uh, they're just, you know, it's not there yet, but Value is not the risk. Usability is a risk. Technical feasibility is a huge risk. Business risk is a gigantic risk. So this is a great poster child example for why product, design, engineering have their work cut out for them. Those, that requires strong people in each of those areas. But do, you, do you think there's like, it's calling for a new kind of a, a framework like like I'm trying to think in terms of you know you mentioned like one week sprint or or like uh, you, you think know? maybe you can't do 15 to 20 iterations per week in discovery if it's a car right maybe. that not okay. that's like, okay, just car um car maybe it's not it's, it's too big scope of a project but um, let's say you know Amazon's echo or yeah. dot or whatever cool. and I would so, you know one of the guys he's left Google now but his name's Tom Chi and Tom um, was running Google X when it was doing the, the glasses and actually the vehicles were starting then. And even the, and everything they were doing then was hardware software. That's kind of what was in his area, hardware software. And he still had the goal for his product teams, 15 iterations per week in discovery. Now you have to be super creative 
it, to do that with hardware. There was a lot of literally wires involved and clay and mold and 3D printers and all kinds of hacks that we do to do these experiments. But you could also argue, or I would argue, it's even more important to do it with hardware because the cost of failure is so much higher. So of all the companies I've ever been in, the company with more prototypes than anybody is Apple. And you could argue, they have to, they, you know, it's critical. You don't want the Note 7 to explode or something. Yeah. Okay, I'll was, right over here. So um, yeah. my question is about uh, MVPs. Uh, okay. In particular, what, what's your recommendation and feedback when the MVP, instead of taking four days, it ends up taking a month, two months, three months? What's yeah. your feedback to product managers, engineers, and leadership team at that, at that point? Well, the issue is almost certainly, I mean, without talking to the team, but almost certainly, like I would wager money, they are not understanding the real purpose of an MVP and the range of techniques that they have at their disposal. So I have this exact argument with teams, well, certainly weekly, sometimes daily, and they'll tell me, we, we can't do that in a day, and I'll say, okay, well, well, let's talk about it. What's your risks? And they'll lay out their risks, and I'll say, well, okay, let's talk about each one of those. We can do this with what's called a, um, a Wizard of Oz test. Users won't know the difference. It'll take us literally a few hours to create. And they're like, and I'm like, tell me why that won't work, because the user won't know the difference. <laughs> and you know, this is we have this discussion, and mostly they don't know what these are. They don't know that there are techniques to address each of these things. And they, a lot of them, their product person was never trained. Remember that their training might have been a CSPO class which doesn't, of course, talk about any of this. I'm, I'm not, not calling on people. It's just that they're passing around the microphones. Um, so. <laughs> yeah, there's one. <laughs> yeah. Can you talk about the role of data science and analytics in this process and the lead times for building models and the discovery process? Yeah. So, I, you know, I talked about product design engineering for sure. And, and uh, there's also, those three are kind of, those are the ones that consistently are there. There are a few roles that are sometimes dedicated. Sometimes there's a fourth or sometimes even a fifth. Uh, and, but most of the time they're shared. And data science is probably at the top of that. Data science is usually that there's like a data, one data science person or one data analyst for three or four teams. Or there'll be one user researcher for three or four teams. And so they're shared, you know, we don't, we don't have them every day with us, uh, but we wish, we, we kind of wish we did. <laughs> um, if you don't have a data analyst, it falls on the product manager. Yeah, go for it. One of the ways a product roadmap ends up arising in our company is when our early reference customers, we haven't delivered everything they have in their vision, and then they ask us a question of when. Right. What's the best way to answer that question yeah. if it's not a roadmap? Well, so um, I kind of, first I, I need to get one thing out on the table. A lot of the lawyers in companies, a lot of them won't let you share a, a roadmap publicly anymore because of a forward looking statement thing, which it's the one time I'm really happy for lawyers. So, because <laughs> we really don't want to share roadmaps, that is locking you in. And so, but that said, a lot of times, Look, the, when you're, especially if you're a startup just getting off the ground, the single most common objection you'll get is your, your one salesperson will come and say, this person said no because it doesn't do X. And this person said no because it doesn't have these things and you have to commit to doing these five things. This is totally common. The best answer to that is not to build those things, which is probably not the issue anyway. The best answer is, oh, have them visit one of our six reference customers because they're running it as is and loving it. And if they still need it, then, then I'd like to talk to them. If, okay, so then. We believe in you. Yeah. We bet on you to be the right guy. And you even showed us that you're the right guy. Yeah. But we do, to continue to stand by you, we. Yeah. Right, I'm with you now. So, you know, product, shipping product or even getting product market fit does not mean the product's done. 
there's still more you're going to add to the product. So you might have some features that the customer, even the reference customer said, yeah, this wasn't critical, but it needs to be there by compliance time or why, you know, by tax time or something like that. And so they are expecting that and they'll ask you for that. You just have to, as product manager, you know, this is you on the product manager, you have to be super careful that you understand the problem behind the, the feature they're asking for. And you have to make sure that what you build is going to work not just for them. One way we do that is make sure you can convince yourself you have several customers that need that or have that problem. Yeah. Yes. Um, also a question for every B2B company here. Um, so real problem, real day problem. You have many customers and the squeaky wheel always gets the grease and you try to be more strategic and putting like really bigger problems to solve on your roadmap. Like say, you know, quarter one, we want to solve emails and quarter three, we want to solve receipts. But your daily things are really happening that your squeaky wheels and customers who are not particularly strategic, but like, you know, short term, we need this field in this report, do it, do it now. Like you get consumed by that. How do you negotiate this? Yeah. What kind of advice can you give to someone in a B2B situation like that? Well, yeah, it happens. It happens a it lot does. with B2B because of, uh, you know money behind each customer but even even like advertisers can do this and consumers they can have that same sort of ongoing irritation um some people refer to this as the keep the lights on activities you know there are some things we just have to do we don't want to do it necessarily we don't think there's like a big win out of it but we just have to do it it's like a tax and i you know this is something you have to make a judgment call is this something just we should just knock it out or is this something really like a bigger thing and maybe isn't even going to be a good use of time and we have to maybe go do a visit with them? So this is judgment. Yeah, if you end up with, you know, just spending all your time doing keep the lights on stuff, you'll have a pretty demotivated team, first of all, too. So, yeah, it's a lot. You know, I, one thing I didn't even talk about with the product manager, but product manager is the one that really carries the burden for motivating the team. That is, and there's a, one of my favorite quotes in our industry comes from John Doerr, the VC and behind Google. He's actually the one that brought OKRs to Google, um, which is we need teams of missionaries, not teams of mercenaries. That is like captures in a phrase the difference between good teams and bad teams right there. And where do you get missionaries? Product manager has to, sh to evangelize. You have to show them the pain. You have to bring them to the customers. And, there's a lot to talk about. I realize I'm just sort of skimming the surface, but um, I... Uh, Go yeah. One last question. Okay. Right in the back, and then it's coming up on 815, so yeah. All right. Uh, do you think designers should learn how to product manage? And also, product managers should learn how to code or design? So, the, um, certainly, the more we learn each other's skills, I think that's awesome, but that's different than asking... Um, uh, it's hard to put on, say, a tech lead to also be the product manager or a designer to also be the product manager. It's not impossible, and there's some real synergy that comes with that, but I always warn the person that even if they've got the talent, it's a brutal amount of hours. There's no messing around. That is just brutal amount of work. So they ha I try to really lay out honestly how much work they want to do, that said, some of my favorite products, I can point you to situations where it was the product manager was also the designer, or in a couple great cases, product manager also the tech lead. So it's just they've got to be willing to sign up for multiple jobs. And as you know, any of those three is a full-time, more than a full-time job. So it, this is not for the faint of heart. Cool, Marty. Well, thanks a lot. I know people would stay here all night. Hopefully, you can stick around a little bit. We'll give away some prizes, and hopefully, we can stick around and ask for us. Let's give them a big round of applause. Thanks, Marty. Thank you. Appreciate it.